Hello, everyone. I am running. Am I running two minutes late? <laughs> I think I am. Let me get you situated on here. All right. I have to fill out all this stuff when I start my live stream. And then I put it on the tripod. So let me start out a little shaky. Uh, but today, I know I will be doing some sketching um, while I'm talking. And then I also have my notebook over here. I have put, like, so much time into preparing uh, for today's workshop. So, as you guys know, if you follow me on Instagram, I was mentioning in the stories um, that today we were doing something a little different. We weren't doing a sew with me today, um, but we were doing more of a workshop. Uh, there has just been so many questions. Um, some of them were left over from the virtual retreat that we had, uh, the first week of December. And then a lot of them are just around the new years and people kind of like regrouping and, um, thinking about their branding and people stepping out for the first time for the new year, like lots of exciting things. So I figured today we would spend some workshop time. Now, this is going to give you just a little bit of a taste of what we do in retreats. Um, because when I do a retreat, we do a couple workshops a day, plus our Zooms with the Q&As and all that. So hello from Texas. I see you there. So for everybody just joining, the numbers are rising quickly. It's great to have you all. I've got all these notes here for what we're going to talk about today is completely different. Today is workshop style instead of sew with me. And man, <laughs> do I need to do some, some scrap cleanup around here. Oh, let's see. Let's read a few of the greetings and then we'll get started after everybody else is settled in. Um, so the main thing we're going to talk about today is differentiating your business. And we're going to define some things um, that I get a lot of questions about. Um, we're also going to define some ethical things. So, of course, disclaimer with that, everybody's going to have a little bit of a different view of right and wrong. So you, you may not 100% feel the same way, but we should all kind of be like in the same area if you like shade it a little bit, right? So, all right. So hello from Texas. Terry is saying, I appreciate what you do for this channel. Thank you, Terry. Um, I love it. I love teaching. And so I'm super excited to do today. Um, I love the workshop style teaching. It's just so much fun. So Melanie, hello from Ohio. Jacqueline, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Thank you for showing up, Jacqueline. I really appreciate it. Um, Sue Davis, yay, you made it here. <laughs> it's great to have you. Um, so you guys, what I typically do is um, I will usually do a reminder on my stories on Instagram about my live stream. So if you don't follow me on Instagram, you're going to want to do that. I'm at Bridal Sewing. And so that's where I gave you the heads up today um, that today was going to be a little bit different. So anywho, let's get started. So I've got some sketching to do. And what I'm going to start out with, with talking about differentiating your business is um, we're going to talk about, um, again, I've got, a I've got a long way to go today. I think it's like five or six pages. So I'm going to move pretty fast. And then if we've got a little bit of time left over in the end, we'll do a QA. and a you, gotta, you guys can always, um, after the live is over, you can put questions in the comments and those questions stay up. Um, the ones that you put in now, they kind of roll off. So um, you can go ahead and put them in. But if I don't get to them, put them in again once the live is posted after, after it's live and it's just kind of living on YouTube at that point. So thank you for the thumbs up, guys. That really helps me. Um, YouTube will kind of push it out to everyone who has requested to be a part of this in the past. So we're going to start with, for a brand differentiation, we're going to talk about some research and development. This is a question that comes up a lot with sewists who are new to a market or new to um, sewing in general. So uh, by new to a market, I'm meaning new to like an area. Like let's say you had an established sewing business 
in North Carolina and you moved to um, Oregon. Uh, you're going to need to kind of get your bearings when you get in Oregon, right? Because the local economy is different. Um, the whole culture of the brides, the styles in, of the dresses that they wear um, can be quite different. Um, the, you know, the weather is different. And that, of course, dictates a lot of, of what they wear. So there, there's a lot of new newness when you move and you do need to do a little bit of R&D. So this is one thing that we did talk about in the retreat and we talked about some do's and don'ts for R&D. Um, everybody has different tactics. Um, one person was saying if your local sewist um, won't share with you about um, average price points, which I feel like most of them would, um, but if you're in a particularly, you know, not super friendly um, market and the other sewists don't want to share. Um, somebody was saying you can send a friend with a wedding dress and, you know, have her go do an appointment and you can get an idea of their prices that way. Um, that one to me is definitely a gray area. Um, I would probably feel uncomfortable doing that, although there's legally nothing wrong with that as long as you don't steal and out outright copy their ideas. So it would be to me, 100% wrong if you did that to get a copy of their contract so that you could just rip off their contract, okay? So um, I would be careful of it in that regard. Um, if you were more using it, and I think this is the way the person was describing it, more using it of going around from salon to salon to get the bride experience, the feeling of the experience in each salon, the pricing difference, kind of just getting your bearings in general, not doing it just to duplicate anything. I think that's probably a little more harmless. It definitely feels a little gross, um, but I would consider it a little more harmless. So in that kind of instance, um, when people recommend things like that, I would say maybe um, for me to consider fair versus unfair, right and wrong, some people caught up, get caught up in how you get the information. Um, I go by more, um, how are you going to use the information? That's more how I look at it. Um, the motives and what you end up doing with that information, I think, can really um, determine whether or not you're doing that right or wrong. Um, but that is a common practice. Um, and it's not just in our trade. It's in, our tra it's in all trades. It happens. Um, another way that I, I personally would go about to try to get an idea of pricing is I would ask the local salons. They usually know the averages that people are paying. Um, there's also often uh, Facebook groups, local Facebook groups for brides, and they talk money there. Um, that's a great way to get some pricing information. Like I said before, it's not going to hurt you to call around and make friends. <laughs> a lot of the salons may, a lot of the other sewists may be completely forthcoming with this information and you're kind of, you know, putting on your investigator cap for no reason. Um, so think of it that way. Another way that I think is extremely valid is to just get an idea of what the skilled um, tradespeople in your local area make. So, um, I feel like as bridal sewists, it's a skilled trade and we should be right on par with the other skilled trades in the area. So you should be making with the plumbers and the electricians and, you know, everybody else that, that has a very distinct skill and works hard for a living and they're a business owner, whatever they're pulling in, it's probably fair. You should be doing something similar to that. Of course, you're going to have to you're going to have to mess around with those numbers because some of the trades, of course, um, have high um, overhead and stuff for parts, machinery, things like that. You got to you got to navigate all that. So I would be looking more at their income. So, um, yeah, and you can do you could find out some of that information um, just on the Internet with Internet searches. So there are some good ideas as far as um, R&D um, R and D. What I keep saying is research and development. Um, so there's that. And um, so I would say when you're doing some R&D, instead of your goal being to copy people, you're going to want your goal to be to um, perhaps get some inspiration. Okay. 
So that would be another way of looking at some of your local R&D. Now we're moving away from um, pricing when I say that. In regards to pricing, I would say um, your goal is not necessarily to try to achieve competitive pricing, meaning, well, she charges $70 an hour, so I'm going to undercut her and I'm going to do 50 to try to get people, you know. I wouldn't look at it that way, but I would look at it in terms of I want to make sure my pricing is fair for the local market. Um, there is a fine line between corporate espionage and research. Okay. I've had multiple instances of corporate espionage <laughs> go on here and it does not feel good. I've had people try to get jobs here, um, pretending like they wanted to work here and they really just wanted to steal my information, um, and to leave as fast as possible to compete with me, um, with insider information, like detailed insider information that no one has any business knowing. That's weird and that's wrong. <laughs> and it does not feel good to have that happen. So if you were to even consider going that route um, for a local sewist when you're trying to grow your business, go ahead and shut that thought down now. Because once you do that, um, you've shown some very poor character and you're going to have a hard time living that down in that area. So there's that. Um, there's a huge difference between corporate espionage and just regular research. Um, also, please keep in mind um, startup expenses. When you're starting a business or you're relocating, there's always startup expenses. So you can buy a lot of your information online. And you can also get free stuff online. There are pro bridal sewing groups on Facebook and wherever else um, that they're happy to share free resources with you. So there's not really any need to do this like underground itchy stuff. Okay. All right. So let's talk about that a little bit more with branding. And this is why I have this here. So if you are just looking at the businesses in your local area, I want to talk about this fine line of um, trying to figure out what's around you. You know, you're new to the industry and you don't know what is um, what's normal, what's kind of weird. You know, you, you're you don't have a good grasp of your local culture yet in that industry. And you, you really want to get your ear to the tracks. Um, but you don't want to copy people. Okay. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, so let's say you've got one sewing business over here that looks like this. Okay. This represents a constellation of branding characteristics that they have, okay? And um, some of it's proprietary, some of it, you know, they don't share with everybody, or it's very, very distinct from anybody else in the industry in the area. So you, when you say, um, I need a sewist who does this such and such thing, some new thing they developed or whatever, well, they're the only one that does it, okay? So, you know, it's going to include things like that. It's going to include the look of their logo, their brand colors, you know, their their marketing style, um, and then proprietary offerings that they have. Uh, one person, you may just have one person that, um, say they do this thing where they do, um, they custom embroider the the bride's monogram and wedding date on the inside hem of the slip layer of her dress, okay? They embroider that in blue on her dress for free for every one of their brides. That's a very distinct offering, okay? I'm sure there's a few people around the country that do that. But you don't want to be the new kid on the block in this new area, either because you're starting your business or you're moving to this area. You don't want to be the new kid on the block that says, oh, 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 I'm going to do that one thing. I'm going to do that too. Because that's just going to be weird. Like everybody's going to know you're just doing it to be like them. And 
certainly you don't want to be like marketing like okay with this attitude of like um well i do that too so you might as well come to me i do the same proprietary thing but i do it cheaper like if you have that kind of way that's when it's kind of icky okay so you've got this person here that's their that's their look all right you've got this other business over here And this is their look. They've got their own way of doing things. The end result for all of these businesses, by the way, is going to be the same. Okay. They're all successful. Um, they all have happy brides. They have good relationships with the bridal salons. We'll just say that. Okay. Um, and then we've got this one over here. They're doing their thing. You guys get the idea. I don't know what shape to make this last one. Let's do hearts. It's pink, right? And Valentine's Day is coming up. All right. So these are all the local businesses, and you're crashing the scene, and you don't want to actually crash the scene. <laughs> You want to make a soft landing into the area and you really want to kind of fit in. Okay. What you might do is look around in the area and say, Oh, I see that, you know, they do this and that and this and that, and just kind of get a average general idea of what they're doing. And that's what you're going to want to come in and do. And you may say like, um, Let's say like, well, I've always liked these brand colors. I, I really, I wanted to do pink and I was pink when I lived in the other state. I, I really want to do pink. So instead of doing, you know, pink like this, maybe you do pink like this. Okay. I'm getting really abstract with these concepts, but I think you can follow me on it. Okay. So you're. You're still going to do your pink, but you're going to have a different twist on it, okay? And you're going to pull from each thing, like, okay, well, I do like this, and I do like that, and I do like this, and I do like that. But you're going to avoid taking anything that's the proprietary thing, okay? If there is one, if you were to say to a bridal salon, What's the one thing that makes um, this sewist different from that one? What's the one thing that makes this sewist stand out? And there's usually like that one thing. That's that proprietary thing. Hands off of that. You don't ever want to copy that thing. What you don't want to do is you don't want to be the person that comes in and you end up saying like, oh, I like this. I'm going to do all of this. I'm going to look around at all the shops, and this is my favorite shop in the area. And this is who I'm going to be. And all you have is maybe one or two little things that's a little bit different. That's weird. <laughs> and you're not going to have a good relationship with this store particularly if you go after this proprietary thing, right? You can look at this and tell that it's off balance. But if you're really, truly learning from the area, you're, what you're offering is going to look a little bit more like this. You're going to pull just a little bit so that you're definitely still in step with everybody. And then your proprietary, your proprietary thing is going to be completely different from what everybody else has. And you've got a whole different look. But you still somewhat fit with what is going on in the area. That's going to be your goal. And then over time, I'm getting to how you end up having such a cohesive look like they do. Like, 
This looks so branded, right? I am getting to that, I promise you. That is um, at the end of this. I'm going to circle back around to this and tell you how this becomes something very nicely, neatly branded where it ends up being your own voice to the client and, and you're very clearly recognizable. That's the goal you want, okay? So it's okay that when you first come into an area, you feel a little weird. You feel like these people have their act together and I feel a little, uh, this is how you're going to feel in the beginning, okay? But lay off the proprietary stuff. Lay off targeting one person and trying to copy all of that stuff, okay? So, and then we'll get to the end of how you can make sure that you've got your own clear brand in the end that still works within the ecosystem of your local, um, local bridal sewing markets, okay? Um, let's talk about, and this is all going to connect, I promise. <laughs> let's talk about referrals. How are you going to get referrals to your new sewing business? You're the new kid on the block for whatever reason. How are you going to get referrals? Okay. I would not go to these people to get referrals. I would be interested in building relationships. And my book goes so much into this. I'm so heavy on building relationships. I would go into building relationships with the local bridal salons, okay? Local venues, they're handing out folders every day that's full of um, vendor referrals, okay? I would be working on relationships, getting referrals from them. You don't try to get these people to send their clients to you. That's never going to work. You don't look... Um, horizontally for referrals. The referrals are coming from other industries that feed naturally into your industry. I hope that makes sense. This is a major newbie problem. They come in and they're like, nobody will send me their clients. Well, of course they're not going to send you their clients. It's their clients, you know? Um, so there's that. So with referrals, you're going to focus on building relationships. And please keep in mind when, when you're coming new to a market, just because you can show pictures of good sewing does not mean that that bridal salon is naturally going to be comfortable with working with you right away. Okay? There's a whole lot more that goes into a referral relationship besides just can you sew. In fact, I will go as far to say that whether or not you can sew well is actually two or three down on the list. It's not even the number one criteria for getting referrals. Yes, they want you to, they want to know that you can sew. Absolutely. But they, it's in their best interest. Most salons prefer to have a nice hearty list of sewists in the area. Nobody's against you being on that list. Everybody wins the, the more choices that are on that list, right? So don't get this idea of like, they just don't want me on the list. You know, they, you know, they think I don't sew good enough or whatever. That, that's very unlikely that that's the problem if you really do sew well, all right? Um, so shops want diversified referrals on their list. This is what they want. Okay. So I have had um, salons tell me this. I'm not just making this up. Okay. <laughs> I've learned this from my relationship, that, from the relationships that I have with bridal salons. They want diversified referral lists. Because when you're working with a bride as a salon owner and you're selling them a gown, 
you understand that there's all these personalities that come through the door. There's different budgets. There's different gown styles. And they can see after they've worked with a bride for a couple of hours and she's picking the dress and whatever, that stylist usually, if she's a good stylist, has a very good idea of which sewist is going to be the best fit for that bride. And a lot of times they'll hand the list and they'll say, here's our list of sewists, but I really think you're going to like so-and-so. I think that's the one for you. Okay. So they are looking at, when I was saying there's a list of things that they're looking at before they refer to you, and it's not just can you sew, it's they're looking at your personality, um, the type of people that you can handle. If you have a great personality and you know how to steer the people with the difficult personalities away from their impending outburst and you, you have a way of like soothe and saw kind of idea, um, you're probably going to be sent the difficult customers from that store. <laughs> it is in the store's best interest to not have that difficult customer come back on them. So you're going to be, it's unfortunate. Here's your reward, you know. But if if you have a personality that can't handle the difficult customers, you're cutting down on the number of customers they can send to you, right? So we all need to work on our people skills because, um, well, they can have a happy customer and then they end up being difficult later just because life circumstances change on that person. Um, but anyways, um, diversified uh, referrals, um, pricing. They're going to want to have a diversity of, of prices. This, this one is a super expensive store. This one is the lower budget bride. So they, they know where to steer these clients to. Okay, they're also going to want their sewist list to be diversified with turnaround time. Okay, everybody on here can't be booked out for a year. If they're booked out for a year, then your best bet when you move into a market is to fill a need, right? This is good marketing right here. You want to find the problem and you want to be the solution. So if you move into an area and you start to see, wait, oh, all these people are booked out eight months or at least. Okay, get your turnaround times a little bit more narrow. Um, offer some emergency services for a lower fee. Okay, so think about the pain points in the market and you can be the way to solve that pain points. Also, another thing that they're looking at for the diversity is the location. So, um, you know, a bride comes in and she's from north of the county. They're going to want a sewist who's on the north end of the county, that kind of thing. And then also, do you have discretion? Discretion is not necessarily always part of personality. You can have a great personality and then you can say some stupid stuff sometimes. <laughs> And you can cause trouble for them. If you don't have discretion and a way of um, diffusing situations and things like that behind the scenes, um, they don't care how good you sew. They're not going to send people to you. That is one of the hardest things to overcome. If I have a sewist come to me, I can't get referrals. And we talk about what's going on. Well, every time there's something wrong with the dress, the sewist turns to the bride, shows the bride what's wrong, and bad mouths the, the designer. And this, this salon knows that this is a problem. I don't know why they keep ordering this dress for your size. I've told them and da 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 da, da. Okay, you're running down that salon the salon is never going to want to send another bride to you again. And it's going to be really, really hard to overcome that. It's a whole lot easier to up your sewing skills than it is to repair um, a relationship problem that you've created from not having discretion. All right. So um, another thing that we need to talk about in this instance that I hear all the time, okay, People come to me and they think they have this unique problem of gatekeeping. They feel like they're suffering from gatekeeping. And I'll tell you, 90% of the time, they're not suffering from gatekeeping. 90% of the time, they don't even know what the word gatekeeping means. They just think there's a playground and there's a gate and somebody's not letting me in it. And, you know, it's just 
everybody else's fault and whatever. And, and they think that's what gatekeeping means. <laughs> it's not. So we're going to talk about what gatekeeping means and what you can expect from other sewists in this industry, what you can expect from the referring salons in this industry. So that way you can weigh out, am I really suffering from gatekeeping or am I suffering from my own entitlement? Okay. And I know both of those are such strong buzzwords right now, but hear me out because I'm going to define them for you. Okay. We're making good time. We're at the 30, 30 minute mark. All right, so gatekeeping versus entitlement. Um, I often hear gatekeeping as a complaint that another studio won't give you referrals, access to sources. Um, now, this is another bridal sewing studio, okay? Somebody on your horizontal, okay? This is not... Uh, it's funny, I almost never hear about gatekeeping complaints that the salon is gatekeeping. And that's usually where gatekeeping happens. It's not usually a horizontal issue. Gatekeeping happens with the person above you. It's part of the definition, okay? So I'll hear about it as a complaint that another sewing studio won't give you referrals. Um, they won't give you access to their sources. They won't give you um, endorsements to the relationships that they've worked hard on building. That means like you go to this one and say, oh, can you please ask the uh, bridal, bridal, bridal shop if they would please start referring to me? And they're like, um, no. And they're thinking, I don't know you. I, I've not ever seen you work with a client. Yeah, your sewing is good, but. I don't even know what your personality is like. I don't know what you charge. Like, I've not, I've not seen the way you function in the community. That's what they're thinking. And then you're thinking, oh, she's gatekeeping, you know? So that's that example of what I'm talking about here. Um, endorsements to relationships can come different ways. Like I was talking about the bridal salons. It could also mean online. Maybe you're expecting them to add your name and number to their website, like, hey, I'm booked, so, but you can go to this person. That's a huge ask. And honestly, if you're asking them to do that, that's more of an entitlement problem. That's a little strange. That would be a huge gift. Like this person has a long-term relationship, working relationship with this person, and they really like the way they do business and they really have faith in them. And then they decide to put their information on their website. That's the way that happens. Not this guy coming over being like, I want you to put my stuff on your website. No, 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 no. And then when it doesn't happen, she's a gatekeeper. She's a terrible person. No. Okay, so it can happen on your own website. And then it can also happen on social media. And we know how this happens on social media. Like, she won't give me a shout out. She won't um, story my post. I posted this dress and I worked really hard on it and it looked really good. She, all she had to do was put it in her stories. She's booked up. Why can't she put it in her story so I could get her clients that she can't take? Can you guess which attitude is at work here? <laughs> That's entitlement. This poor, this poor sewist over here is getting blamed for all the entitlement. Okay, so that's how that goes. Um, so you can't say if you don't post stuff endorsing me, you're gatekeeping. No, no, that's not how that works. Okay, so again, um, if, if any of you have talked to me about this recently, this is not personal that we're covering this. I hear it all the time. And you might feel like targeted, like I'm... She's talking to me because I just asked. No, no, it's very, very common. So let's first define what gatekeeping truly is. And then let's give some examples of how gatekeeping happens in the industry because it does happen. Okay. And you want to know how it happens so that you can grow out of it or circumnavigate it is usually the instance there. All right. 
So internet, I, all I did was I searched gatekeeping and I went to a wide variety of sources. The first one was the Oxford English Dictionary and they're saying it's an activity of controlling, usually limiting general access to something, okay? So that means it's access that everybody generally has, but somebody's keeping you from what everybody else gets access to, okay? So most of us are not truly gonna experience that definition of gatekeeping. That's pretty difficult, all right? Um, that's like a teacher saying, um, I need you to write this research paper and all the kids in the class get to go to the good library. And this one kid only gets two books to write her paper from, you know, that is kind of the definition for that. So that we're not going to see it. It's usually a little more subtle or behind the scenes. Um, okay, so the Urban Dictionary um, it defines it as someone that takes it upon themselves to decide who does or does not have access to rights. Okay, we're talking about rights. You don't have a right to somebody else's customer, okay? But they take it upon themselves to decide who does or does not have access to rights, to a community, or to an identity, okay? Okay. So for this one to gatekeep in terms of saying you don't have a right to an identity, that's more going to manifest like um, gossiping and saying like, she's not really a bridal sewist. Like she's really bad. She's, she is not a bridal sewist. I'm telling you, like she's more like um, she does casual tailoring and now she's new in our industry and she's trying to say she's this and she's not. That's what they're talking about. Okay. Sociology Dictionary says, um, and this is this is more what we're going to see in the industry, honestly. It's requiring ever-increasing credentials for certain jobs, okay? So these, these, custom, these uh, businesses got on the referral list just because they were good at sewing. This one got on the referral list because they were good at sewing, plus they pay a referral fee. This one, in order to get on the referral list, has to be good at sewing, plus play, pay a referral fee, plus have a fashion design degree. And the only reason why they're raising the bar is to shut this one out. That is a very, 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 very ground, like grounded definition of how we see that in the industry. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, insider.com says gatekeepers pull the ladder up behind them. This is, they were speaking specifically for gatekeepers within social media. Okay. Which is a whole other beast. Um, this is different from real brick and mortar businesses within one community, right? Um, gatekeepers on social media Pull the ladder up behind them. And I wanted to unpack what that means. This means that the opportunity that Soist A had is no longer available to Soist B. All right. They got in on some network or, you know, something or whatever, and they don't, you know, this person doesn't have access. No one will let them in that network to grow. All right. That's what that means. Um, to be clear, Soist A is not required to lift Soist B up the ladder. Okay. Soist A still had to climb the ladder. It's just when she got to the top, she pulled the ladder up. So nobody is saying that Soist A climbs the ladder and now that she's at the top, she has to pull Soist B up. That's a lot of times when we'll hear people complaining their gatekeeping is because they're wanting a free ride to the same level, the top ladder. Well, Soist A took 15 years to climb that ladder and Soist B wants it given to them on a platter. They just want to be lifted right up to it, you know, in two months. No, that's unreasonable. That's entitlement. All right. Um, so SOAS A is not required to lift SOAS B up and give her a free ride. If SOAS A had to climb the ladder, then SOAS B had to has to also. Okay. 
I do see a question coming in, Michelle. I am taking questions, honey. I'm not reading yours. It flashed up, but I am taking questions. So I'm going to circle back around. I'm going to try to stay on here to get into the Q&As here. The only reason why I'll cut the Q&As off at the end is if I'm just, um, it's it's like way too many or something. I'm not expecting that. But if if I don't get to your question, guys, write it again once this live gets posted permanently. Um, write it in the comments and I'll get with you, okay? Um, this is a perfect example, all right, I, that I wanted to give. When I was reading this, I thought of this story. Oh, it's a terrible story. Terrible. Oh, story time. Okay. You guys ready? Um, I was reading a book about the Titanic, but it was not about necessarily the nitty gritty of the details of like, you know, the dancing and the sinking ship and the violin. And it wasn't the classic idea of the Titanic. It was, it was so cool. It was the litigation that followed the sinking of the Titanic, okay? Very juicy stuff. There was this woman, and she was tried for this. She was on a boat. She was on a lifeboat, okay? There was room for other people on the lifeboat. And when they put their hands on the side of the lifeboat to try to get in, she smacked their hands with the oar to make them fall in the water and freeze to death and die, okay? Freeze to death and die. That's redundant. They double died because of her. They died with painful knuckles. That is a very wicked woman. She was tried for that and she should have been, okay? She was essentially murdering those people. So what I wanted to be clear about with this gatekeeping thing, this is what reminded me of it, is... A gatekeeper is somebody who takes that oar and knocks your knuckles and gets you off of the side of the boat, okay? A decent person in the community says, there's room in this boat, come on in, okay? Does this person have to risk capsizing the boat or being pulled into the icy ocean by a frantic person trying to get on the boat? Do they have to risk their life to pull someone else in the lifeboat? Okay, that's a very real risk. Are they under any moral obligation to do that? No, they're not. They can stay in the boat and be like, come on, come on, you can do it. Yep, put your foot up and maybe help a little bit or whatever. But they're not required to do anything that's going to knock them off balance. Or if they're on the verge of unconsciousness, nobody's expecting them to rouse their last three calories to save this other person and then die on the boat. Okay, nobody's asking that of them. But what you don't do is you don't work against the person trying to climb in the boat. That's where the gatekeeping happens, okay? So you need to be careful. And I feel like that perfectly illustrates, um, are you suffering from entitlement or gatekeeping? Is somebody actually busting your knuckles on the side of that lifeboat? Or is it just that they're not risking their life pulling you in? And that's what you're upset about. Okay, so um, true gatekeeping. Let me give you some scenarios of how it truly happens in our industry. This is real world scenarios that we see. Um, a stylist who is friends with sewist one only refers the good jobs to her. She refers difficult or low paying customers to sewist two. Purely out of spite, or to keep so as to from flourishing according to her skill level. Okay, so there's a lot of requirements there. It's not just um, this person deals better with difficult personalities. That's not what it is. They're doing it to discourage this person from the industry, to make them make less income. Perhaps they'll leave the industry. It's the goal that we're talking about. All right? Lying about supplies. Sewist B asks Sewist A which boning she likes to use. Sewist A lies and gives her the brand of a subpar quality boning. This person goes off and tries that 
and her dresses or the support of her dresses are failing and she can't figure out why do her dresses not have wrinkles and mine do. Okay. That's just cruel. This is busting knuckles with oars, right? Um, that is definitely um, gatekeeping. Or she gives her a more expensive source um, for the same thing, um, significantly expensive, that kind of thing, um, to cause harm. Okay, so we got motive and stuff involved in all this. All right, so another example would be shop owner. Did you guys know that there's all this much drama <laughs> that goes on in the industry? We doggies, we got some drama. Okay, shop owner is friends with Soist A, and she will refer to Soist B, but only for a referral fee, which she doesn't require of Soist A. That's ugly. Okay, or she'll say, sorry, we're only taking on Soist with design degrees when Soist A wasn't required one. Okay, so that goes back to one of those definitions we were talking about earlier. Also, gatekeeping, it's important to note, there's a whole different section for this, is we haven't talked about it. It can be purely psychological, okay? It can be more like bullying. It's an emotional thing, okay? So, um, clicks that refuse to communicate with the new sewist in the community just to pressure her out of the market, all right? You guys are locked in in tight and you're emailing each other or you're on a group text and you know that this bridal show is coming and you're all going to be there and you purposely don't invite her and when she walks by if she shows up at the show you look the other way and give her the cold shoulder it's a social click thing that's happening okay also it could be that they're telling rumors or slander against her this is without cause other than competition or jealousy. Um, so you can't go around being a jerk and copying proprietary stuff and whatnot um, and then blame the cool breeze on gatekeeping. All right. So th there's a lot of moving parts, again, in that situation. So you kind of need to assess what you're doing at the same time, too. Okay. Okay. So what gatekeeping is not? Now, this is the most common thing that I hear. Um, the, oh man, I have five of these listed and I hear all of them all the time. So I can't really say this is the most common. Um, the sewist beside you, okay, this is if you're working in, Let's say you're working in a larger sewing business and there's four seamstresses, okay? And you come on, you're the new kid, and there's three other ladies working there, okay? You've got your manager, and then you've got three other sewists, and they sit you down beside the sewist. The sewist beside you is refusing to train you, okay? It's easy for you to go home and say that's gatekeeping and she won't teach me. She's clearly the best one. She's right beside me. And I lean over and say, how is it that you do this and that? Or my needle keeps putting pulls in my horsehair braid. How, do, how come you don't pull your horsehair braid? What's the secret? And she won't tell you. Okay. Now it sounds like gatekeeping, doesn't it? Okay. Now listen to the whole sentence. The sewist beside you is refusing to train you for free. If she doesn't receive a stipend to train you, it is the manager's job to train you. The veteran neighbor is probably sick of training people for free and they quit anyways. Okay? So keep that in mind. That is a management problem, not a gatekeeping problem. A sewist has a right to keep her head down and do her own work. She's not required to give up her time for you. Okay, so like let's say all these sewists here, they make 50% of the final ticket on whatever sewing they do. If you're pulling her away with questions for two hours out of the day, she's losing that much money every day to helping you when it's this person's job to train you. So now when you look at that whole scenario, she's not a jerk, is she? She's just trying to provide for her family. The manager is the jerk, all right? So this is, that's very common. 
Um, now, the next thing is gatekeeping is not um, when you refuse to give shout outs. You don't owe anybody a shout out. Nobody owes you a shout out. Shout outs also usually don't work. I mean, they're great. Sometimes they do, but they usually don't work. Okay, but nobody owes you that. It's free advertising. If somebody wants to do it, that is very, very nice of them. But don't ever expect it and then call them a gatekeeper because they won't give it to you. All right, also um, not giving referrals. None of these other SOAS, if these are all independent shops, they don't owe you referrals. Okay, um, not sharing your work or information on social media or their website. That's not gatekeeping. We covered that. Um, and then this is another thing that's very important. When we go back to this proprietary information that we were talking about, if you steal proprietary um, things from somebody else's brand and the way they do business, and they come along and squelch that, they give you a call and they say, hey, I'm the only one within four states that does this, and you just moved into the town and started advertising that you're doing it, and you never even did it before where you came from. You stole that from me. Them calling you on it and squelching that, that is not gatekeeping, okay? Squelching plagiarism, brand coattailing, or brand confusion, that is not gatekeeping. Okay, businesses are legally required to squelch encroachment on branding. See trademark laws. Okay, so that if you want to research it, um, trademark laws in the U.S. say um, Adidas can't have, you know, uh, Walmart making pants that look just like Adidas and they've got the logo on it. And then, um, uh Nike starts putting Adidas things on their shoes and then Columbia makes jackets and put Adidas logo on it and they let all this go on and don't say anything. And then all of a sudden, um, some backpack manufacturer comes along and puts the Adidas logo on it and Adidas tries to sue them. Trademark law in the U.S. says, um, I'm sorry, you haven't defended your trademark for the past 10 years, and we've got these other major players that have been using it. It's now considered just, you know, general um, general branding usage. You, you, can't, you can't consider this uh, trademark infringement. So it is very important um, for this sewist to confront this sewist and to tell her to knock it off, okay? That's not her being mean. You were out of line and legally you should be called on that. So um, what you're not going to want to do when you come in as the new kid on the block is you don't want a constellation of similarities with, with one certain other brand, okay? You're wanting to generally fit in the market, solve some problems uniquely in the market, let your proprietary thing be different, just like everybody else's proprietary thing is. And that's how you're going to get some harmony within the market. All right. Just remember, this is my last point on gatekeeping. And then we're going to get to my diagram and we are making perfect time. I'm so excited about this. Um, I warned you guys, I have prepared, this is like <laughs> my list of stuff here. Okay. A gatekeeper controls access to something. That is the heart and soul of it all. Um, if they are flagging your posts to get you blocked, like unfairly, that is gatekeeping. Okay. If they're trying to convince others to block you, like, hey, guys, let's all block her from our stories. And so we can we can have a like a challenge going on in the community and she's left out of it and she doesn't even know. OK, that's gatekeeping. OK. Um, and all of this has to be um, because it not because you are trying to steal or copy. OK, they're not doing it because they're like, this person is um, uh, has crooked business dealings and we don't want to be associated. That's a whole other deal. If they're just doing it to pressure you out of the market, that's that's what we're looking at. 
All right, so here is the final thing, our big goal to get to, um, the best ways to differentiate your brand, all right? So let's say you have moved into this area and you're looking around and this happens a lot. You just really like what this person has going on. And so you accidentally bring on too many things that are too close to their brand, okay? Super common. It happens subconsciously. You didn't mean to do it. But sure enough, if somebody blurred their eyes, they would think that you were trying to knock off their brand and coattail their brand and confuse the customer, okay? That's the big difference here. Your constellation of characteristics are confusing the customer. The way you avoid that is, and it's very affordable, work with a professional graphic designer or web designer. It doesn't cost much. If you are still, you're doing all your market research and you just keep accidentally looking a little bit too much like this other store, if you put this project and all this information um, that you've done you put it in the hands of a professional graphic designer or web designer, they're going to look at everything that's going on in the area and they're going to be able to come up with your own look that's going to fit in um, to, the, to the local need, um, but yet be distinct. Okay. Good branding has clarity of message and distinction. This copying, whether intentional or unintentional, it's bad marketing. It's bad branding. It's not even going to work for you. There's no need to try to copy somebody because it, it won't even work because it's lacking your two fundamentals of clarity and differentiation. Okay. Um, let's see. Clear, unique messaging, what I was just saying. Um, that's going to come through. Um, the clear, unique messaging is going to come through in the way you handle your social media, the way your forms, logo, graphics, all of that goes. Okay, so that is very much morphing right out of that graphic web designer um, idea. All right, so another way to make sure that you don't accidentally do this is make sure you're investing time in yourself. You put your head down and work, okay? You just put your head down and work. You, you're too busy to be looking around and accidentally copying people, right? So you want to invest time in your business, not invest time in studying theirs. You need to study theirs a little bit just to get a feel for the market, and then you need to knock it off. You don't, you don't keep hounding another business. Keep on their trail. That's just weird, and it's going to put some social weirdness between you, right? And, and that is spending too much time. That's where you get into that accidental um, copying, okay? Um, in fact, one time I heard a YouTuber do this. I was listening to this YouTuber, and I thought, oh, the cadence of her voice she sounds like such and such YouTuber today. She doesn't sound like herself. And I kid you not, the YouTuber I was listening to is like, I love this such and such YouTuber. I've been listening to her a lot lately. And I'm like, oh, I heard it in her voice. So sometimes that can happen and you don't even realize it. All right. So the last two are the most important. One is uh, for differentiating your brand. Um, you. You. Your personality, your skills, your approach, that's what's really going to set your brand apart, okay? Have confidence in yourself. You don't need to be anyone else. You don't need to be smacking people's knuckles. Nobody's competing with you. You just all want a chance to be in the boat, right? Nobody's asking for you to drown yourself or capsize the boat. But you don't have to worry about anybody else getting in the boat either. There's plenty of room for everybody. And then finally, um, relationships are really going to set your brand apart. 
because you're going to have your own unique relationship with clients and stores, okay? You don't need to be the new kid on the block and bust into the scenes and expect um, these very solid long-term relationships that these other sewists have with one another. Maybe they've worked, you know, in harmony in the same, you know, community for 10, 15 years. You don't have to bust in and be the new best friend and expect them to all be just as close to you as they are to one another. That's a little bit unrealistic. So you really need to work on, you just be friendly with them, give it time, and work on building your relationship with the businesses that actually refer to you. The bridal salons, the venues, the wedding planners, that kind of thing. And that's where you're really going to gain traction with referrals, all right? So you don't need the relations with the other local sewists in order to grow as a newbie in your community. The relations with the other sewists are something that you're going to want over the long term and it's going to be organic. Now that is my whole spiel. I'm ready to look at Q and A's on this. And that was exactly one hour and 45 seconds. Woo. All right. Let me look at these and see if we have any questions and then I'll jump off. I know I've kept you guys so long today. Let's see. Um, we've got so many people here. It's exciting. Hello, Hannah Lee. My BST bestie, uh, Janix Atelier, hello from Norway. Wow, hello. Did I tell you I had Norwegian in me? I might have. Okay, let's see, Victoria, I had it noted but lost it. Where's the best place to buy lace fabric? It depends on um, the kind that you need. I do have videos on that, so search that lace um, because I use different suppliers for different types, okay? Irene, I'm so glad, BST Bestie, that this was the perfect topic for today. Um, yeah, so if you call them challenging brides, the stores are going to send them to you, unfortunately. But that's how it happens. Hello, Iris from Germany. And Michelle, let's see. I hope it's okay to ask this. Of course it is. My son sought out a job being a free caddy to a videographer in exchange for learning opportunity of wedding photography. Is it okay to seek out that kind of opportunity? Michelle, that's the perfect way to seek out the opportunity. The whole idea is the way that it's not corporate espionage is that they're both on the same page. So that videographer knows that there, it, there's an exchange going on. The videographer knows that your son is learning skills from him, and he knows that he has the end goal of sharing the market with him. And that's fine. Um, it's all about, you know, what are you saying you're wanting to do? Uh, is, is everybody understanding what's happening here? Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's just a good old fashioned apprenticeship kind of idea. And that's been going on for thousands of years. And that's a, it's a great way to learn. It's mutually beneficial is what's very important. Um, if somebody just tries to get hired on here just for corporate espionage sake, what they're going to do is they're going to stay while I'm paying them for me to train them, okay? That's a huge investment, huge drain on payroll, okay? So they got paid, I trained them, and I received no benefit from them because as soon as they were trained, they left to compete, and they left with my information. So do you see the difference? So that's that's what this is from. So um, Irene, um, hi, I'm full for brides until October. The bridal sewists around here don't network. I'd like to reach out to them to make referrals. Do you have any tips? So you want to reach out to give them brides. Is that what you're saying? I think that is incredibly generous of you. Um, what I do is I do send brides to other sewists in my area, but I just don't use the word referral. Um, because that can come back on you. Legally, referral is a legal term, okay? So there's somewhat of a responsibility for the outcome, okay? So 
Um, I would just say, here's a list of other sewists in the area and they've always done great work for me or the work that I've seen has always been great. You know, you can check them out. You can interview them. You can, you know, however you want to word it. Um, I would put it that way. So hello, Johanna and Michelle. Yes. Yes. So your son is spot on. He's doing just fine. All right, guys, is that everything? I'm going to hop off. I know I've kept you for so long today, and I'm sorry for those of you who are just now joining. This live stream was not my usual slow pace, so with me, with ending up with a QA and a at the end. This was a full workshop on um, how to differentiate your brand. So if you missed it, it is a solid hour of teaching. <laughs> so you're going to want to go back and listen to it. And if you have any questions, as always, leave them in the comments. Happy New Year to everyone. And thank you so much for attending. Rebecca, it's great to see you. I'm glad it was helpful. You guys take care. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Bye.